Good morning. Welcome back to our survey of church history. Last lesson we looked at persecution in the church um, in the period of earliest Christianity. And remember, we've been talking about that as the period from the New Testament to about 311. And, you know, the next period maybe starts around 325. So there's a little gap in there. But this very early in the 300s, everything changed in the church. So the, this early period is this period of persecution. And it's also a period of doctrinal development and um, dealing with heresy. So we talked about how the church experienced periodic, it was like pop-up persecutions. It was flare-ups in these various places, but all of the time they were a minority who was um, not well regarded and people were suspicious of them when we talked about that. Um, and then this, this uh, great persecution at the end of that period was the highest level of persecution that the church experienced. We have one more chair in this corner, and then we'll start pulling out chairs when we come in, when more people come in. Okay. The parking lot is full. Yeah. The parking lot is full. Uh -huh. Who's here? I don't know. Okay. Well, onward. So last lesson, after we, we talked about persecution, I passed out the letter of St. Ignatius to the Romans. Um, and now, you know, I've, I've talked to several of you, and it, it's if you find that these readings are challenging, you are not alone. Because yeah. the, these ancient writers, even though they're translated into modern English, it doesn't always feel like modern English, it's does it? And some of that is the translation. It is English. So some of this, some of that is the translation, and some of that is just it, it's just different, right? It's two thousand years ago, and it's just different. And so we have to kind of work our way through this. So let's talk about Ignatius' letter to the Romans. What stood out to you? What did you get out of it, Chris? Throughout, he says, "I'm ready to die." For my faith. Don't, don't try to dissuade me. Don't try to don't, don't try to dissuade the authorities from telling me. I'm ready to go. But he says something that's really struggling. Okay, let's let's give the con let's make sure everyone understood the context and then I want to hear that he last on, part. He was on his way okay. to Rome to the execution. Okay, so he, we need to know this and I, I said this last time but it has been a long time since last time and we have had a lot of ice under the bridge <laughs> since that so we have to understand that this is a letter Ignatius is writing while he is being transported he is uh, under um, he's a prisoner being transported to Rome to face his trial and he assumes his execution and it is in fact it will in fact be his execution and so everything he writes he writes from that perspective he's writing to the Romans as he's going to Rome and he's expecting to be executed okay Chris continue and he's saying don't try coughing out of it I'm ready to go and he said something that really struck me he said I'm ready to leave this bad world Okay, find that for us. Give us the, the uh, he's, there's I chapter and verses in it. Oh, you don't have it in front of you. Okay. But it was just, it was very early in the letter. Well, so I, I, I don't remember that line in there. I don't either. But I he mean, does say nothing visible is good. He right. says the work is not of persuasiveness, but Christianity is a thing of might whensoever it is hated by the world. This is in 3.3. 3. And so you have that sense of he expects the persecution that he is himself suffering right this minute um, to be uh, bad, but a benefit to Christianity, to in increase the strength of the movement of the good news throughout the world there. Well, yeah. I what else? That oh. wasn't quite it. Okay. Well, he was uh, talking about the world itself being a bad place to be. He would rather be in heaven, which is a good 
like to be, which is slightly different from what Paul says, for we live as Christ and die as glory. Okay. But it's a bit of the Greek philosophy that things that are tangible are bad. Okay, things that are tangible is bad is a bit of the Greek philosophy, and we're going to talk about that a lot today. So hold on to that yeah, idea. That, that that really jumped out at you is okay. Well, I don't, I didn't take that from it. So if you find, if you borrow a copy and find a passage, we'll look at it specifically. What else? Mary. The first thing that struck me, struck me was it kind of follows the form of Paul's letters. It's a, it's a, it starts out with a greeting. Mm -hmm. And at the end, he mentions other people. He says, he says who he is first and then who he's writing to. And he uses some of the same words like salute and either bonds or bound. I didn't go back and bonds. That. Yes, he does. So it has some of the same structure. Yeah. Yeah, it does follow that. And that's because Paul used the structure of an ancient letter that was very common in that period. And so, yeah, we we do see, and it, it, it rings of the New Testament in other ways, too. First, the structure of the letter, but also echoes of that language. He says, as I be poured out as a libation to God. Well, Paul had said, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering and the sacrifice and service of your love, then I rejoice with you. You know, and so we have that, those, all of those same ideas and even echoes of the same wording. What else? What does he expect to happen for his execution? How does he expect to be executed? Torn by wild beasts. He, he expects to be, and we, Dr. Stanglin mentioned this, that this was one thing that happened in this period. This is probably around, what did we say, 70? I'll have to look on my timeline. Um, a period that Christians might be put in arena and the, and a, like a pelt, a bloody pelt put over them so that oh, wild beasts would yeah. tear them. It would kill them in the arena for the amusement of spectators. And that that happened to Christians in the spirit. And that's what Ignatius is expecting to happen to him. And you can tell he refers to it sort of obliquely in a couple places and then very clearly in a couple more. Yeah. What else? I had to look at cheat sheets because I'm a real concrete person. And if it doesn't, if it's allegorical or, you know, the beast here, I, I miss that all together. But the cheat sheet that I looked at and was trying to interpret it, uh, talked about that he did, he was torn to pieces by lions in the Colosseum. And he said, I think 87,000 Romans were seen there applauding oh. his demise. So it, it kind of came true. But they also said that, or, and I don't know how true this is, is that Ignatius was was um, a child held by Jesus. If you heard, heard, I have they, not they heard that. How fascinating. They gave different scripture references where, you know, Jesus, Jesus called the children. Called the children and that Ignatius was that Says child. he was one of those children. Oh, like, how fascinating. I okay, let me. that could be, but, but maybe that was the tie-in that Ignatius, how he felt so yeah. drawn to Jesus. So let me repeat that for the mic because I want to make sure um, I get it for the uh, remote and the microphone. So um, Pam was saying that um, the supplementary material she looked up said that Ignatius did in fact die um, by beasts in the arena in the Colosseum in Rome with what did you say 87,000 Romans in attendance for their entertainment which was common in this period and this is why when Dr. Stanglin said it's some of the most cruel deaths um, that humans could imagine and so here we have that sense of cruelty and that sense of um, uh, sort of voyeurism and in, uh, in violence um, that we recognize as one of the problems in the Roman culture. And she also said that um, her reading said that Ignatius, as a child, was one of the child children that was brought to Jesus as a baby. Let all the children come unto me. And I haven't heard that before, but what a beautiful image. And you do see here um, his his uh, passion for following all the way through. He wants to complete his service as a Christian 
by dying as Jesus died. And he feels that he must go all the way through and not escape to really have um, taken up his cross and followed Jesus. So it's in, in, quite remarkable. Yeah. In, in 4 2, it said, uh, I may be found a sacrifice for God. Yes, that I may be found a sacrifice. And I um, thought about that. Um, Yet if I shall suffer, this is 4 3, then I am a freed man in Jesus, and I shall rise free in him. So we have that reversal, that upside down nature of the kingdom, whereas where a slave to Jesus Christ, a slave in the kingdom of God is true freedom. And he feels that he's fulfilling that in his death. Now, I don't think everyone needs to die for Jesus to really have done it all the way, right? But he is in this period where the only way he doesn't is if he somehow is broken out or he recants or, you know, and he wishes to be a testimony in this way. And says, don't interfere, even if I ask you to later, right? And uh, that's in um, 7-2. Even if I change my mind and say, rescue me, don't do it, because I, I want to be faithful and follow all the way through. All right, well, any other comments on Ignatius to the Romans? Well, in 3-2, I, I pulled out... Uh, I may not only be called a Christian, but act like one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And for him, that means dying in the arena. But we can see how, you know, there are many circumstances where it's not easy to do the right thing. And the, these kinds of um, this language uh, is uh, it's very inspiring for us to do the right thing, even when it's difficult. Okay, so, um, you know, persecution in this period was a significant unifying church mm -hmm. in a time that the church was transitioning, right? Apostles had been there to say, we can authoritatively tell you what the right truth is about Jesus and what you should believe about Jesus. And then those apostles start coming to the ends of their lives and you have the generation that knew the apostles, but eventually... You just don't have any of those direct witnesses. You get into the next generation. Well, that is a time of transition. This is a time they have to figure out. How are we going to judge teachings for truth and what will our standard be? So this week's video looks at the development of doctrine and the church's efforts against heresy. Um, now, if you are watching this video after the fact, then this is what you'll want to pause and go to the CCS website and view the video module four. And Dr. Stanglin at one point in the video suggests that we pause and look up about a million scriptures. But, um, you know, we looked up however many we were going to look up beforehand. We're not going to pause the video. We will read three of them in our discussion after the fact. We're going to watch the video straight through. So let me work on this. Mm -hmm. Recording in progress. Okay, so we are back. We are back from our video watching. Um, and we had some sound problems, but we are back from our sound problems, hopefully. So Dr. Stanglin in that video was mainly talking about this period where doctrine is developed. Now, when we say developed, we don't mean what we sometimes mean as developed, which means changed, right? In doctrinal development in this period, we mean um, making it systematic, making it precise, um, talking with each other and saying, what did Jesus really mean? And what has he always meant? What did the apostles teach? And what have they always taught? And the development aspect of it is that getting it more specific. So does that make sense? It's that codification. And I made sure to put the definition of codification in your handouts today so you would have it. Uh, because that's um, an important stage here, and it will be an important stage again when we get to the Reformation in the 1500s. You know, because there is some like, because that's such a big change and that codification stage is where things get specific. Okay, so now what is heresy? Dr. Stanglin specified. What is heresy? Contra no. 
Christian false, Christian false teaching. Okay, so the Christian part is important. It's, it comes from within the Christian faith. Someone who is not Christian cannot be a heretic because they're not, not saying they're it from within Christianity. It's it's false teaching from within the faith. And can can heresy be about the small things? Yeah. So. What one of the ways that Dr. Sanglin specified is that it's really about elements that are central to the Christian faith rather than the small details. Okay, now the problem comes in do you think what's small and what I think is small? Maybe what you think is small, I think is a big deal, or vice versa. Right, and so that becomes the difficulty. But the true meaning of heresy is where we're, we're talking about the central teachings of the Christian faith. And we'll talk about how do we decide what the central teachings are of the Christian faith in a minute. So, um, what, so, so Dr. Stanglin gave all those passages, and you may have read all of them, and I tried to make it easy to read all of them with a link. I don't know how many people it worked for. Some, okay, good. Bible Gateway. Um, if you use that website, you're able to, if you use the right format, separate them with semicolons, you can string together a bunch of verses and then just scroll down through them. And so that's how I tried to set that up. Um, let's read three. Uh, will someone please read uh, Matthew 24, uh, 23 through 24? Loudly. Someone have that? Yes. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking. Matthew 24, verses 23 through 24. And they're written on the board for your convenience. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Okay, so we have in there that fundamental idea that there will be false teaching in the church. And Dr. Stanglis sort of referred briefly to how some scholars think, oh, the early church didn't care about what was correct doctrine. They weren't that organized. But we see even from the mouth of Jesus, yes, there was this idea that there, if there's false doctrine, that means that there is true doctrine and that you should be able to know it. Isn't that right? Um, so... Second Timothy four, three through four. Good, Valerie. For the time will come when men when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around they will, will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. <laughs> Keep on. Um three and four, I lost the reference. What did you yeah. have? How far did you go? That was just three. Okay. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn it aside to myth. Thank you. Okay, so we have that idea that it's going to be appealing, that it will be somehow, um, uh, he's, my translation says his ear, their ears tickled, but it will be somehow uh, beneficial to me, like it will feel like it's an advantage to me to go for some false doctrine. And that idea is present all the way from the New Testament, isn't it? And now let's do Jude verses three and four. I have those, so I'll just grab it. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. We have that idea of handed down, like this is the standard. The thing that was handed down becomes the standard. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into licentiousness. We saw that in the immorality section and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. 
Okay, so if you read all of those verses or a bunch of them, what struck you about those passages or what strikes you about these three that we just read? There will be those who will turn against God. Yeah, it will happen. It will happen from the inside, right? It's not, it's not just from the outside. We saw persecution from the outside, but from the inside, we have this problem. Okay, what else? Not everybody's going to agree. Not everybody is going to agree. It's going to be difficult. And we have that today, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What else? It tells me as an individual to keep watch on what I receive without and balance it or judge it. Actually, judge what you hear. You need to judge what you hear. And it's not a one time does all. Right. Okay. So that idea of having to keep watch as a person, as a family, as a church community for our doctrine and our beliefs and continuing to judge it. And so in this period, they're, they're dealing with what is the standard against which we will judge it. You know, that's what they're, that's where they are. The apostles are dying off they're, We're into the next generation. So what will our standard be? You know, it's very striking how many of these passages there are. This is not a minor concern of the New Testament. It's a significant concern of the New Testament, right? And so central Christian doctrine, central Christian doctrine exactly. And um, they, we saw that they do all those instructions assume that you can make a choice. You do know what to compare it against. And we saw in some of those, there are already people saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh, which sort of leads us to what Dr. Singel spent quite a lot of time on, that idea of Gnosticism. Now, someone, take a stab, don't worry if you don't get it all right, but take a stab at telling us what is Gnosticism. <laughs> You've got two pages on it. <laughs> so, Okay, it's a false teaching. It is, yeah. And that's a good start. A belief system. It's a belief system that. False yeah. A false belief system that. Jesus couldn't have been God because if, if he was human, he couldn't be God. If he was human, he couldn't be God and vice versa. If he was God, he couldn't be human because the, more, the human mortal world isn't good and God is good. Okay, so that is, so the, the center kind of the, everything else stems from is this dualism, this idea that material is bad, matter is bad, bodies are bad according to Christian, uh, uh, Gnostic teaching, this false teaching. And this idea that the spiritual world is separate, the good spiritual world has to be completely separate from the bad material world and therefore jesus could not have been human and divine is the false teaching and that's the core of it right there the other piece of it is that salvation comes from secret knowledge that only a few can gain now when we look at the old testament how did god act in the whole the old testament secretly no. How? Well, in the garden, he was right there with them. He was right there with them in the garden. Yeah. What about later? Jesus he revealed himself publicly. He revealed himself publicly through the Israelites. There were all of these historical events that were there for anyone to see. And so that 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 key idea that God is the good creator who created a good world that we are created good our bodies are meant to be with our souls they're not something bad that we have to get rid of to have our best soul life right our best soul experience instead we are integrated beings of body and spirit and that that's good and that god publicly did salvation works so that they're available to everybody. That's kind of the core of what Christian teaching taught. Okay, I wrote down this. It said Christianity equals a unity of these extreme dualism. Yes, body and spirit, not body versus spirit. So that that the Christian orthodoxy and orthodoxy is uh, just the word that captures right teaching. So even though some churches use the word orthodox in their title and we're like, yeah, but I'm not that church, so I'm not orthodox. But the word orthodox means right teaching, orthodoxy, right belief, right teaching. Um, so, yes, orthodoxy taught that idea. And this 
uh, well, why do we think Dr. Stanglin spent so long on Gnosticism on this, in this video? I think they were the main challengers to Christianity. Okay, it was a very significant challenge to Christianity in this period, particularly like second century, you know, kind of spreading over the next it's already starting in the New Testament. You can see yeah. there's pieces of it. It's not fully developed till later. It sounds like if you were Gnostic, uh, it was like, well, I'm evil to begin with anyway, because I'm in this body. So what the heck? And when I die, I'll go to heaven and that's it. And okay. So why worry about all this? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. So I, I want to I pick up on a phrase you said, if you're a Gnostic. But a lot of people just thought of themselves as Christian without realizing that these Gnostic ideas were infiltrating or, you know, a lot of these ideas were in Greek society. And so if you already think that way and you read about how um, Paul says, I, uh, I have to, uh, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, you know, we get that. Then you start thinking of those terms of matter as bad. bad. Paul does not mean that bodies are bad. Paul means he's trying to capture the sinful nature. There's a words he's using for the sinful nature. And sinful nature and matter or body are not the same in the New Testament. But it's easy to start thinking that way, especially since that's such a pervasive thought. Now, do we have that today? Do you see elements of... Dualism? I think so. Do you? I do. Where can you can you come um, up with an example? It's hard. I can be specific, but I know when I have conversations with my sister, I think she believes very firmly about and things that I'm like, well, I don't believe the same way she does. So I think that is what you're talking about. Yeah. As having differences, you know, in this in, so in the same even just in the general understanding of controversy right. driving um, doctrinal development, doctrinal codification, um, that is true. And, you know, it's we are people who learn. We are created to learn. So if we get if we're somewhere and you're like, I don't think I've been thinking about that right. And now I'm going to, I think I've learned something. This is a good thing. This is not like, and before I was not saved, you know, like we're, we're people God created to grow, we're made to grow. So that's okay. Those conversations are not bad. So, Go ahead. So when, what you said that when you think that way, you're not saved, but. I don't think that. That was an example of something I don't think. Okay. Just to be clear. <laughs> that we can't get it right. I mean, we are saved by grace. And if yeah. you're going to talk about being saved over this stuff, we're in big trouble. Yeah, I do think... <laughs> I I'll speak for myself. I'm in big trouble. Yeah. You know. there, and and we, I do think it's important to get the core of Christian doctrine right. And what is the core of Christian doctrine? So let, I want we're so far out of time, and we had all our glitches. Okay. But So I want to cover two more things. One is, I think Dr. Dr. Shanglin spent a lot of time on this because it drove development of doctrine in this period, so it's a major factor, but also because I do think we have a lot of body versus spirit dualism in our culture. And I've seen, once I've been thinking about it, this has been on my mind the last couple of weeks and I've thought of, I've noticed a lot. So what I want y'all to do um, I don't have a separate reading. I do have a separate reading if you want it, but only for those who want it. So we're, I'll take a show of hands in a minute. What I want you to do for this week is think, watch, think about it. Where do you see examples in greater culture, secular, or even in Christian culture of that body spirit dualism in the idea that uh, to, salvation is escape from my body, escape from the material world, or ideas of, well, the body is bad and I need to do the spirit. So I, I'm going to not take questions just because it's so late. So think about that this week and see if you can come up with any examples. The other thing is in 
Dr. Sanglin's conclusion, he mentioned three things, which are actually, I think, kind of the core of this lesson that I want to highlight. He talked about apostolicity. So there has to be a standard. If you're going to guard against false teaching, if you're going to pay attention and try to believe the right things and follow Jesus in the right way, then you have to have uh, something to judge it by. How do you judge without something to judge by? And so the idea behind their standards was apostolicity, meaning from the apostles, coming from the apostles. And there were three ways that they paid attention to apostolicity. And he mentioned them, but it was, it was quick. The one is succession of church leaders. So Paul said, I hand it down to you and you hand down to them. And it was like this succession of people where you have human connections, where you teach the right things to a human being and those humans teach their churches. And so having church leaders, this would become the system of bishops that came to be very prominent in the church in the next years. So succession of leaders. Second, the oral teaching of the apostles. Remember, he said, what we have told you and what we have written were the two things, oral and written. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you capture the oral teaching of the apostles? What does that mean? And so um, this is something that um, Irene, he mentioned Irenaeus and how Irenaeus wrote against Gnosticism. In multiple places in his writing, he says, we judge by the gospel story. And and then he tells the gospel story. This is what it is. It means that Jesus was conceived, Mary, born, ministered in these physical places, died a physical death, was read. You know, he tells the gospel story, and that's the lens that we're supposed to use to understand scripture. It's like, okay, knowing the gospel story will help me so that I don't go to scripture scripture and say, aha, Jesus was a phantom. Because I can pull scriptures and make it sound like that, but not if I'm starting from the gospel story. And so this came to be called the rule of faith. And the rule of faith was just a, the words varied. It wasn't always the same words, but it was the gospel story. Okay. What do we have? And in, in our Sunday morning practice, we say it every week, that tells the gospel story in oral form. The creed, right? This is why we get creeds going forward, is it's trying to capture the oral teaching of the apostles. And the apostles' creed is one of the very earliest. Um, so, you know, you have in it things that speak against Gnosticism, don't you? I believe that God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth. God is the good creator, right? That is a piece of the Apostles' Creed, which may date from about 215 AD. We have the earliest document that has the Apostles' Creed in it. One good date, possible date for it is 215, right in the center of when this Gnosticism is coming about. And um, the whole point, and it, it's in um, interrogative form, and it's it's a test. Do, it's, do you believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord? And so remember it mentions um, that he died and was buried. Those are things that happen to physical beings, right? And he ascended into heaven. He will come. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, right? That's why that's in there. Body and soul. Body is part of the resurrection. Jesus was resurrected in body. He did not turn into a phantom after resurrection. He was not a ghost. He ate the fish, right? The body, bodily resurrection was an important part of the early church's understanding. So that's, and then we develop more creeds. That system of creeds comes out of this oral teaching. And then the third one is the writings, the New Testament. And this is the period in which there's a lot of attention given to nailing down what's in the New Testament. Okay, well, next week we're going to move into the next phase of the church's history, which is a period of ecumenical councils. It's a period of coming together and developing creeds to deal with other heresies. So very interesting, and I will look forward to it. Before I let you go, 
I have a reading that is Dr. Sanglin's suggested selections from Irenaeus against heresies. It is harder than Ignatius. I, I mean, I just, it just is. Uh, but it's good to read and you can, there's two places in it where he has kind of that rule of faith idea where he tells the gospel story and you can tell that's the lens. Who would like a copy? I'm just making copies for who wants one. Is there a link? Is it harder to understand or is what he has to say hard to hear? It's harder to understand what he's saying in parts of it, but not in others. And if you access it online, there is a link, but it, you have to click through. Oh, I'm supposed to go to book one. Okay, I click book one. And now I have to go through to chapter this. You have to like navigate to each of the, pa he has separate passages. In the printed version, I just have it all in a document. So if you're here and you want to read it, take the print out. Okay. And then um, anyone who was wanting, thinking you might want to buy the um, Apostolic Fathers, some their writings in a book form, Maybe you want to have it like not just on a printout that you're going to lose. Um, this is a good version, and I have it for you to look at. Thank you so much. One of the things they said was they had to think. And so that's what we have to do. We have to think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? You want to tell about Cynthia in case anybody didn't hear her? Oh, well, she. Well,